Brilliant. So you will hear uh, a message and Wei Wei will be one of the great people helping us today from the create team. If you can admit the people and get rid of the waiting room, maybe Wei Wei, that will be really useful. So um, you hopefully have gotten the program that we mailed, but because this was really popular and we had to kind of put a limit to the face-to-face -face people so we could have the interaction afterwards, we have this two part uh, where the first, the lightning talk is live streamed um, and um, it's a, for about an hour. Uh, we have Marion Carré joining us from the Ask Mona Paris. And she's going to do a kind of overview and introduction and talk about the challenges and areas of application as well as opportunities. So she's going to try and do it in 15 minutes and everything else is going to be about five. And I, although it's really interesting, all the talks and from different diverse perspectives, we asked them to squeeze to the five minutes so that it would give us about an hour afterwards, which we thought is really important for all of you to bring all your very different perspectives, questions, experiences, so we can have a discussion because this is an area that's shaping up so fast uh, that it's really important, I think, to more raise the issues rather than necessarily trying to find answers at this stage. Um, there is just housekeeping for the ones in the room. Toilets as, as you go out the second corridor to your right-hand side. Uh, we have afterwards, we'll explain this coffee and tea that feel free during the talks as well to go and help yourselves. Just try not to make too much noise if somebody's speaking. We won't have time for a proper break because we know it's a Friday afternoon and we wanted like to do everything within two hours if possible so that we could have the reception afterwards, which is four to five and all of you are invited. So you're more than welcome to stay. And um, I have put up there. So hopefully the people in the chat have has seen um, we've turned on the transcriptions as well. And you will have seen, keep your questions go coming. Lynn Fershuren, with whom I'm co-organizing this, she'll say very quickly, hello. <laughs> and um, Lynn and I are both co-directors with Gareth Bill from Archaeology of the Digital Cultural Heritage Lab from the Arts Lab. And this is co-organized with the Creates Digital Technology theme, which is fairly new, it's a few months old. It's me and Tim Barker over there, who'll say hello, who's one of your chairs afterwards. So we're very grateful to both Create and the Arts Lab for supporting a lot of the things that we will consume apart from the food for the mind. So um, Lynn will keep track of the questions because we're doing the first bit hybrid. And afterwards, when we have the Q&A after the talks finish, she will also bring in um, the online questions if, in case we haven't seen them. So before I pass on to Marion, are there any questions or anything anybody want to say? No, you're all good. Great, I will stop sharing. And um, I think everybody has joined from the online. So I will pass on to Marion and I'll try to pin her. So you see her all very clearly from Paris. No, actually I'm not in, um, I'm not in Paris. I'm uh, in uh, Helsinki right now because of oh, another conference. Okay, okay. So okay. that's the reason I wasn't able to to join today, but um, in person, I mean. But I'm I'm very happy to be to be here online. Marion, I didn't have time to do introductions for our speakers, which is why we send bios to everybody in advance. But I know you have it in your slides, so I will stop now and pass on to you. And we have various screens in the room, and hopefully everybody can see and hear her. Okay, brilliant. So on you go. Great. Um, so just to say a, a few words about uh, who am I, um, because I think it it will be useful for the rest of the of the of this uh, presentation. Um, so I'm um, I'm thinking about I'm I'm working on art and artificial intelligence since more than uh, seven years now, and um, I'm, I have various perspectives and approach around this topic. So the first one is that I, I would say that I'm a practitioner of uh, artificial intelligence, which means that uh, with my company, Ask Mona, we build artificial intelligence for museums and cultural and heritage organizations. So it's what makes me able to, to be like um, boots on the ground um, in artificial intelligence and to really uh, build this kind of, uh, of technology. 
I'm also acting as an expert uh, about artificial intelligence. So I'm, I'm lecturing at uh, various uh, universities, but also lately I've been appointed as um, an expert for the AI Strategic Committee um, for the cultural sector from the French Ministry of, uh, of Culture. And also, um, I, I am a creator, so maybe in the next presentation, you will uh, learn more about it because I won't have time to talk about this. Uh, but lately, I, I published a book and just a quick stop uh, on this because I think it's important to, before talking about artificial intelligence, to mention the humans behind artificial intelligence. And this book is about a woman uh, who, who was a pioneer of artificial intelligence. Um, and this book is talking about the need of uh, diversity in the teams building artificial intelligence to make sure this technology is uh, here for the needs of, uh, of everyone. So that was my uh, quick presentation. Um, so now to, gi to give you more information about uh, Ask Mona. So our vision is um, to to use artificial intelligence um, to improve the way we learn because we really believe in the impact um, artificial intelligence can have in the way it transforms the way we interact, but also the way we learn. And museums are places of lifelong learning. And this is why we are using it to transform the, the visit experience um, and to help um, cultural organization and cultural venues uh, becoming a um, more welcoming place uh, by engaging with uh, personalized uh, experiences with, uh, with their visitors. Um, so that's the goal of uh, what we do. And more concretely, we we are using uh, artificial intelligence to enhance the visitor journey uh, globally. So before the visits, um, we develop some tools that are available to answer all visitor questions uh, before they go inside an institution. During the visit, I'm going to talk more about it uh, in a few minutes. And after the visit, we also created something that is a um, an object, uh, a magnet um, visitors can buy at a museum shop to have a conversation with a famous character or with a painting, which is a way to continue the learning after the visit and also for visit for our cultural venues to have new revenue stream. So for this presentation, because I have 15 minutes, but it's still going to be to be quick, um, I wanted to focus on a, a concrete project um, we developed at Eskmona to give you um, feedbacks about, about it, because when we talk about um, AI for heritage, we can talk about a lot of various things, but I wanted to focus on audience engagements and give you some some learning, some key learning from from projects we we've we've been doing lately. Um, so the reason why we decided to to focus on what AI can bring to audience engagement is that we've noticed that most of the time um, the visitor experience in terms of learning can be a one size fits all where everyone has access to exactly the same content on labels, but also on other kind of information that could be uh, uh, made available for individual visitors. And even if people have different backgrounds, sensibilities, knowledge, uh, they have access to exactly the same contents. So we wanted to find a way for visitors to have personalized content based on their needs, on their interest, on their sensitivity, um, to make sure that uh, even people who don't feel um, really um, like we're not really familiar with uh, with like the the cultural experience uh, when they go inside the cultural organization they can they can find what they need and they don't feel ashamed to 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 ask questions or this kind of situation. Um, so this is why we decided to build um, AI assistants uh, that visitor can used to ask any question they have about uh, artwork or like any point of interest available. Um, and we wanted those AI to use only curated information from museum teams. And because when we saw the rise of ChatGPT, so we called ourselves uh, seven years ago, Ask Mona, because we, at this time, we 
already um, wanted people to be able to talk with uh, with artwork because we were convinced about the power of conversations for learning. But at this time, the technology wasn't ready for it. And so when we we've seen the rise of ChatGPT and other like generative uh, artificial intelligence, we were thinking like this is great and this could be the time to finally have those kind of uh, learning experience in museum. But the issue is that um, we can't relate on the data um, because all of those issues of hallucinations you, you may have heard about with, um, for example, if you at some point and asked your GPT what was uh, Napoleon's favorite plane, and I had to answer even uh, it was a French plane, um, even if a uh, plane didn't exist at the time of Napoleon. So it's the kind of things we didn't want to have at all uh, during the museum experience. So we focus our research and development work on how can we control the data used by um, an artificial intelligence. And so, this initial um, research leads to uh, the video I'm going to, to share with you right now. Um, so I think you can see now the video. Uh, can you put your finger like this, if it's OK? Yes. OK. So I'm pressing play, and then I'm going to explain more. But I think a, a video is always, the, is always a, a good way to, to learn. So here is the video. Oops, just sorry. Um, I don't have the the subtitles in this one, and it's in French, so I'm going to uh just change my screen. Sorry, so starting again, and we are yeah. I save you the beginning. Sorry for this. Sound, Mona. Was this? Did it have sound? Yeah. Now it's okay, and you're going to have the subtitles. So that was a very short video, but I think it um, it helped to see uh, how it can um, uh, work in the during the the visit experience. Um, so th there was sound. I hope you you get it, but otherwise there, there was subtitles and and the sound was uh, in French, but French Canadian with a specific accent. And this is one of the reasons it was really interesting to to work on this project also to see even with like some languages uh, particularities and things like that it could uh, it could still uh, still work so now with the time left not a lot i'm going to share just some key takeaways um about things i i haven't mentioned so what was most inter interesting for visitors is this possibility to have like personalized content about things they were interested about and to also um, improve the accessibility and the inclusivity of the contents uh, that uh, that is shared. And for cultural organization, it was a way to. Um, I'm hearing someone. I think it's okay. Uh, for like cultural organization, it was a way to um, uh, be to to easily deploy multilingual. Um, because they were able to um, 
to also learn uh, the questions people were asking about artworks and so they can have feedback about uh, what people think in front of it and how they could uh, um, adjust and make evolve the content that is already available for them in the in the exhibition. And some key takeaways also about what you, you should be um, what you should uh, care about when doing those kind of project, like the kind of critical points. Uh, the thing, the first one is about transparency. Uh, so to make sure that people are aware that they are talking with an artificial intelligence, to also explain why, and to also there is this issue of complementarity with the with the guys. It's, it's a question I have a lot. And this tool is here, of course, not to replace uh, guides and interpreters, but to have like a complement approach for, for visitors. The second important point is this issue of quality of the response by AI. So to have those kind of uh, possibility uh, as we did here to make sure that it comes from a created um, knowledge base, which is something important. And the last thing is about um, security and data protection to ensure the robustness of the tool. So to make sure um, people can't use it in a way you don't want to use it. Uh, so to to have like uh, ex extensive tests and also uh, take care of uh, of data protection. So there are the few things to to make sure about before before doing those um, those kind of projects. Um, so I also wanted to, if you're interested about art and AI more globally, to share with you some um, some resources um, and publication I, I contributed uh, to lately. Um, so here are some uh, some some links that I can I can send you my presentation after if you want to 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 go deeper into uh, into this topic. So I think I'm I'm good for the the time I was allowed to to talk um, really? and. So do not hesitate to to ask me question uh, after if you if you have some. Brilliant! Thank you so much, Marion. We're going to clap here from you, <laughs> as you can hear, and the online people will probably clap online. Thank you so much, and that was a nice segue because you also mentioned some data preservation and security issues, which I'm sure uh, William Kilbride was very thrilled to see because we're going to finish today uh, the last of the talk talking a little bit about some of those questions because we talk a lot about creating and using this material, but not what are we going to do with it longer term as well. So thank you so much. Uh, what I'm going to do now uh, the second presentation, unfortunately, is from Amy Adams, and unfortunately, she couldn't be here with us today. <coughs> and apologies, because I'm at the end of a not contagious, but very annoying cold. So bear with me today. Um, Amy is going to uh, the presentation she sent us because she's works with collections Hello, management. I'm Amy Adams, the collections information. And that's the thing about having it pre-recorded. <laughs> She starts right off. Um, let me share that on my screen and make sure the sound is there so the online people can hear it. You saw that Amy works uh, with collections management and they've done really interesting work at the Royal Museum, the Navy one, with a lot of very large data sets and very large collections where they've been experimenting. And she's also one of the um, kind of theme leads of an online group that she mentions, I ask, and she mentions very usefully for some of you that might be excited, but feel there were quite a lot of that felt that they were novices when you were filling your registration form. She's using some very nice tips about how you can get on and kind of find out a little bit more if you want to delve deeper, including one of the JISC mail AI and cultural heritage mailing lists that she helps co-moderate. Unfortunately, um, she was due a very long uh, annual leave and she couldn't come to Glasgow the way we offered, but she sent the presentation because they're doing really interesting work. So I think it will be interesting for us uh, to hear and I'll shove it back so you can Hello, I'm Amy Adams, the Collections Information and Access Manager at the National Museum of the Royal Navy. And I'm Can I just pause to check with the online people? Mariona, I can see your face, for example. Can you do a thumbs up if you can hear okay? And see the film? Brilliant. Okay, I'll get started then. Sorry, I can't be with you today, but hopefully I can talk you through in the next couple of minutes some of the work we've been doing on trialing AI uh, in our collections management work. So to give a bit of background, the National Museum of the Royal Navy tells the story of the Royal Navy and all of its constituent branches from its earliest formation to its present day, and we have sites across the UK. 
We have really extensive collections um, as well, over 2.5 million items. And I like to give a bit of a trigger warning here because um, as we represent an armed force and also one that was really involved historically in the British Empire, we have collections which may be offensive, upsetting um, or triggering for individuals. But please do get in touch with us because we're constantly trying to think about how we could better represent these histories. I've been at the National Museum for over a decade now and worked in various roles sort of in archives in that area, but my work is constantly more and more focused on digital like many people's. So why we were interested in artificial intelligence, particularly in our collections, is because we have quite a large collection, over 2.5 million items and limited resource like many people and we were interested on how this could help our workload but also how it could transform, uh, transform our collections and make them more accessible in different ways so thinking about what I like to call the data mountain in order to make our like, collections management system our online collection really operate well we need to have input a lot of data so how could we help and uh, generate that data in a different way and also maybe bring a different perspective to things as well that kind of cut out that curatorial bias that we might have when we're cataloging as well. So about a year ago, we had the opportunity to start trialing some of these. And what we did is uh, worked with the University of Southampton's Cormacis Research Department on a number of areas, looking at, first of all, um, an image recognition project, which we then carried on with uh, affiliated uh, researchers at the Catholic University of Leuven, looking at ship's portraiture and whether we could train a system to recognize and tell us what the classifications of the ships and the images were. So please look up the research paper we did about that. Also, we did another uh, one which has been in the news a lot, so please Google it, around the uh, image archive that's being generated around HMS Victory and the conservation work that she's undergoing and how to better organize that using um, AI technologies. And then also we had a couple of opportunities looking at how we could generate keywords or entities from sort of really well-written descriptions in our catalog, not only with the researchers, which again, we'll hopefully publish soon, but also with our collections management supplier, Axial, who are interested in how these technologies could better enhance our collections management systems as well and embed right in our kind of existing data. So please do get in touch with them. I'm sure they would love to talk to people about it. What are some kind of initial reactions we've had from this? Well, first of all, it's not an immediate solve all. These technologies, as many people know, they do have issues, they do hallucinate, they do make gibberish up as you can see the top two um, things. So they're not perfect. They do kind of cut down time. So they might generate kind of 10 things, 10 times faster than a human, but again, it's not always right. So your workload for staff perhaps changes from generating the information to validating it, which can kind of have its own problems problems and it definitely has bias so for example you really have to think about where these things are trained you can see the example at the bottom we've done quite a lot of work to think about some of the terminology we use on our catalog particularly some outdated language or better contextualizing things so for example we tried to remove the term battlefield trophy and better contextualize how these items might have come into our collection well, what does the system immediately come back with but battlefield trophy and you have to think well this system might have been trained a couple of years ago and therefore it doesn't have up-to-date information or is it trained kind of in the internet um, and therefore it's going to pick up the biases from that so there are still kind of questions around the ethics about it and also how useful it is depending on the size of your data set but what i would say is that there is definitely something there they're definitely useful technologies it's definitely the future and would really just encourage more cultural heritage professionals to get involved with these technologies and question them and how they're trained and how they think um, so that we can make sure these technologies best represent kind of um, our histories and what we you know the knowledge we want people to be able to understand and um, contextualize so that means that we're going to do some more work so we're now doing some more project looking at uh, handwritten transcription which i know a lot of people have played around with but we're also looking at how we could use large language models like chat to actually write uh, descriptions of things like our photographic collection but we're also looking at how they could help um, in cleaning up our data so deduplication of some of our digital assets for us um, and finally, I'd really just encourage others to get involved as much as they can with these technologies. We set up a group called AI in Cultural Heritage, so please join the JISC mail for that. We try to meet every couple of months and showcase um, some things people are working on. Or there's the one AI um, for LAM, which is a little bit more based in the States than they do a kind of yearly conference. So please do check them out as well. 
and really just get involved, learn from others. There's lots of people doing projects out there now, and so it's easy to learn from others. So real whistle stop tour, but please do get in touch. We'd love to hear more from people um, and engage more. So please do get in touch if you'd like to hear more. Clap for Amy anyway, and we'll pass on the things. Um, that's really interesting, I think, looking at the collections management side of stuff. And it's, it was complimenting Mary on some of the ways she was talking about engaging with visitors. So looking, starting with museums, we're going to move to contemporary art and different kinds of galleries. So also be patient. I, I'll bring it there, Sarah, if you want, or whatever you want. Okay, so next one is Professor Sarah Cook, my colleague from Information Studies who is going to take from me the lovely kind of handheld thing yep. and is going to try while I'm introducing her, we'll try to connect yeah, with what? Share screen from here. From here. Okay. So she'll share her slides from there because she has a lot of artwork. Great. It looks fine. Perfect. And while she's doing that, it's what is very interesting. I found what, um, Amy said about now moving, it's not less work, it's just different type of work, moving from generating to validating. I think it will be very interesting for the discussions afterwards. On to Sarah. Okay, there's a pink clip and a dress and a problem. zipper and a, how does that sound? Can you hear me okay? Can everybody in Zoom hear me okay? I'm, hello Marion, c'est très gentil de voir aujourd'hui. Um, Thanks for coming. And uh, this is going to be a whistle stop tour through some of the work I'm doing now. And I will try and keep it to five minutes. And apologies if some of you have seen some of these slides before. I'm in the process of undertaking research into art and AI uh, from my position as a curator of contemporary art who works in partnership with museums and galleries and festivals wherever seems appropriate at the particular moment. And I've come to this because I have continually work with artists who work with new technologies um, over 20, 30 years, and whatever that technology is has changed. So it hasn't always been AI, you know, it's been CRISPR or biotech editing, or it's been video synthesis, or it's been data visualization or simulation. So, you know, whatever the technology is that artists are working with, I'm there next to them trying to figure out what they're doing and why they're doing it. And what does it mean for the rest of us who understand the role technology plays in our lives? Um, so so I thought I would, whoa, now I got to get this mouse in the right place. That is freaking me out. <laughs> Hang on. Um, I thought I would show you just a, um, like recent headlines that have come up, of course, and these are not recent. These are like already two years old about the anxiety society's feeling about what AI is doing to contemporary art, that it is going to change what we think of as the real and the authentic and that it's going to make artists obsolete and I'll just point you to other books you can read about this problem because I think contemporary art acts as a lens for understanding the role of AI within creativity as a whole and, and that's a good question for me and you know we use we come across AI tools and have done for a long time without even thinking that's what they were. And of course, Google autocorrect is a very good example of that and autocomplete. And uh, I do this all the time. I just screen grab to see what um, Google is thinking. And, and these are the things that come up when you ask about AI art, you know, pres preservation, copyright, ethical issues, illegal issues. So these are the current sort of concerns about art and AI. And I think that says a lot about what we're thinking in terms of what our roles are. So then I thought, okay, let's just go the whole hog. Let's use a lousy AI PowerPoint generator to generate me a PowerPoint and see what it has to say. And of course, it's not going to say the correct things, but I'm a curator. I'm interested in exhibitions. I'm making exhibitions. So here is a bit of a lousy PowerPoint that a software called Gamma made to tell you a history of AI art exhibitions. And it gives some definitions of AI art, which are kind of appropriate, I suppose, because it says artworks that are created or influenced by. And I think this is a real question that people have now. Is a work of AI art, does it have to be made with the same tools or can it just critique? And this is an age old problem within contemporary art. You know, how critical is it of the technology that it uses to make the art experience? Um, and I'll tell you more about that after I serve on a jury for an AI art award and we have a big debate about it. Um, 
But then I asked it, okay, so what about AI art exhibitions? Because this is the popular form in which this work circulates beyond those headlines in the newspaper that are full of anxiety about what AI is going to do to contemporary art. And um, doesn't this look like a great, exciting list of exhibitions? Problem is only one of them is true. Okay, so yeah, it would be nice to know that the Pompidou had done a big show and Marion, I'm sure you'll be on that soon enough, but they haven't yet. And then similarly, okay, you ask it about generative art exhibitions because that's actually got a longer history within contemporary art to talk about generative art, the terminology around how artists use technology changes all the time. So you might go from systems-based art, as was discussed in the 1970s, to art made with generative systems, as was discussed with early computing in the 80s and 90s, to now talking about AI art in the 2000s onwards, right? And that's a, that's a really exciting list of generative art exhibitions. And that list is also completely not true. None of those exhibitions have happened, though if Tate wants to invite me to curate that show, I will happily do so. Um, but actually there is a long history of art using technology and it is very well documented. Um, it's just perhaps not as widely circulated and this is why it's useful to think about the way in which the art that museums and galleries will commission could inform a history of our understanding of what this moment is like to live with these technologies that are emerging that we don't know what changes they're going to make in our lives. And so this is this is partially like my job right now is looking at these books and looking at the very long list of shows that have happened um, and just how many more shows are happening. And I mean, this these two pages are just shows between 2019 and early 2020. And that's 2020, 2021, you know, and they are all over the world. Um, and so there's actually a growing critical mass of this stuff. None of this work is necessarily making its way into museum collections yet. None of it is being preserved yet. So how much longer do we have to live through endless group show after group show after group show that has one of everything about art and technology. I mean, this is my life. I've been living through this for a number of years and I don't want to do it again with AI. So you ask, you ask generators to talk about, okay, well, what are the significant works of art made with AI? That's what everybody wants to know. That's what every curator wants to know. Which thing am I going to buy for my museum collection? What am I going to commission? What's going to be the key work? And of course, it just comes up with the really, um, the really straightforward, boring ones, like the first portrait, which gets recognition because, of course, it was sold for 400,000 uh, Christie's, which, you know, it's not an interesting work of art and AI as far as I'm concerned, right? It's a representational portrait. This does relate to that earlier headline that we saw about could AI help us restore Rembrandt paintings? Perhaps. Um, and this is just style modification. Other things that come up are, of course, these sort of machinic hallucinations. And so I just want to remind you all, in case you haven't seen it, is this going to play? I got to click. Oh, sorry, my window's in the way here. Um, this is Refik Anadol's um, Unsupervised Machine Hallucinations, which was commissioned by the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, in 2022, uh, which takes the entire collection of the museum and its entire database, all the digitized images of everything in its collection, design objects, as well as artworks, and then runs it through some algorithmic, why does that look so strange up there? Um, maybe it's just that one screen. Okay, I'm gonna ignore it. Um, creates this algorithmic machinic hallucination of the collection. I prefer this. These are photographs I took when I was at MoMA to see this work. So you can see the size of the LED screen in the lobby. That's impressive. The screen is potentially more impressive than the artwork that's on it. These photographs of mine are of um, uh, catering staff setting the space up for a wedding reception. Okay, let's just think about the interface between high technology, contemporary art, corporate spaces, public museums, and the finances that underpin them all. And 
in keeping with that spirit, let's have some words from Hito Sterl, that mean images, which is a term that Hito uses to talk about these machinic hallucinations, are social dreams without sleep, processing society's irrational functions to their logical conclusions. They are documentary expressions of society's views of itself, seized through the chaotic capture and large scale kidnapping of data. They rely on vast infrastructures of polluting hardware and menial and disenfranchised labor, exploiting political conflict as a resource. It's an extreme view, <laughs> but if we want to talk about AI industries and in whose interests AI technologies are being developed, it is worth remembering the exploitation of not only labor, but also environmental resource in order to allow things like that massive LED screen to sit in the lobby of MoMA. Can I just say that now that MoMA has done that, that frees any other museum from ever having to give their entire database of works to an artist to allow a machine to hallucinate on it. It's done. You don't need to do it again. Don't waste the resourcing. The room, sure exactly. So I would instead point you to artists who are engaged critically with these questions of engineering and these questions of ecological sustainability around new technology, because this is the question that we're going to face if we're going to live in a future with AI to understand what AI might do for us as a society. So I'll just point you to Tiga Brain. You know, I'm really of this opinion that artists who are engaging with AI are actually continuing a much longer history of work where artists have critically worked with technology and like asked questions of it and they've hacked it and they've misused it. And this is really important. And AI is just yet another technology that artists are gonna do this with. So let's look back and consider what we've learned from how artists changed TV, how they changed radio, you know, any other technology, the way artists use it changed how we related to it. And Tika Brain, who herself is trained as an environmental engineer, as well as an artist, she says, I treat art as a form of eccentric engineering. I think about how art can be a space to do experiments with systems, with logics, with imaginaries and engineering, and to ask questions of the status quo. Um, and I will just, I will end there because I think if we're talking about AI as a study of human intelligence, then we're also talking about art where we might be talking about the functioning of humans and not just of the computer system itself. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'll have to stop sharing. Sorry for the technical. Oh, I need to give you back the microphone, which is clipped to me. Great. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> just pass on to Paul. Great. Thank you so much. Because this raised so many interesting questions. And we're going to move a little bit from museums and galleries. To library for our next two speakers. Let me just give me a sec. Um, get your slides up. Do you want to introduce yourself while I'm doing that? Yeah. Shall I grab the microphone? Yes. Just speak from here. Hi everyone. I always I always prefer the handheld microphones because they make me feel like the very few occasions in my life like I'm a rock star, but I'm not gonna sing, so it's all good. Um so my name's Paul. I'm professor of library studies and digital scholarship, as Maria said, in information studies. And I'm gonna be talking a bit today. Um it's kind of a personal journey through AI, and I think it's kind of useful for, to do that. Always oh, gonna set an, an alarm. Can you see that? Just so I can share my time. Thank you, Maria. Um, so, so starting off with sort of a personal journey through to and through AI, I guess, oh, because I think it's, I, I know Maria was mentioning when earlier on about people who feel like novices in the room. And there's quite often still to this day, a, I, I often feel like a novice in the room. I'm not a technologist. I'm, I'm a trained professional librarian who went into, into research. And my interests were always centered, as, as I'll explain in a couple of seconds, on 
on sort of human interactions with digital resources and sort of coming from a background, as I'll just explain now, where I was initially a librarian in broadcast media. My background was working for BBC Sport for several years. And I was there in the early 2010s when they were considering the sort of shift towards digital ways of working and digitization of archives, trying to shift the digital workflows. And this has kind of really informed my development and thinking as a researcher over the years, because basically it didn't work. It sucked. And I, it's always been this thing in the back of my mind of looking at like humans using information systems and information systems for humans and this this gap that quite often exists between the design of information systems that ultimately uh, were in the past aimed at humans being very specific about that because increasingly information systems are also being designed for non-human actors which i think is a significant shift in the past 15 to 20 years but also the fact that these things that are being designed for humans often don't actually work for us. And so my research has always been interested in that kind of um, productive tension that comes through and understanding why that occurs. So I've kind of outlined here some of the projects I've been involved in and the way they develop from, from exploring concepts of access and usage to exploring the role of artificial intelligence. And so like Digital Library Futures was a project I was, I was PI on, exploring access to electronic legal deposits in the UK. And one of the conclusions I came to that oh, the, the doctorate was in early days, I was like, well, loads of people want access for computational purposes, but actually the core audience doesn't need that. That was my sort of 2013 conclusion. Coming to 2017 and looking at the electronic legal deposit, legal deposit being the, the collections that the national and research libraries are collecting on behalf of and for the nation and looking at the way that it's explicitly excluded to do data mining on those collections. Moving through to 2019, when I was a PI on a project um, investigating the creation of a global data set. I'm going to problematize that a bit if I have the time. So I haven't started my watch. Um, and then moving on to other projects, which, which I started off from this application of machine learning techniques to this challenge of creating a global data set of digitized texts, and then gradually moved into this space, exploring the impact of AI and machine learning on different groups of people, both practitioners and users. And as I'll explain with the iReal project that I'm working on at the moment, and I'm gonna just flag up a couple of my colleagues who are working on that. So Abdin Abouish in the corner here is research associate on that project and Rosie Spooner over there is the co-investigator or whatever the AHRC is now calling them. Um, and it's kind of, I guess, a journey through that stuff for you. But first I always think it's kind of useful to be on the same page about about what we are talking about. Perhaps a better word with here would have been what I'm talking about. So I kind of see artificial intelligence as this umbrella term for machines that perform tasks requiring human intelligence, especially when the machines learn from data how to do those tasks. We won't get into the sort of the, the, the philosophy behind that, but are they performing tasks? Are they imitating the tasks? Do they have a form of in, in human intelligence or are they having the appearance of that are all questions that frankly are far outside my area of expertise to answer. But AI therefore encompasses a kind of wide range of interrelated and overlapping technologies, things like machine learning, natural language processing, and deep learning. So there's all sorts of of, of tools that come under this big umbrella that we could be talking about. Generally, as we are today, and as I think many of us do when we talk about this, we utilize this umbrella term. And that maybe comes from like the hype around technologies and the fact that AI is the thing we're hearing about on a daily basis. And the majority of work going on in libraries, which is where my work's primarily situated, actually refers to machine learning. So LLMs, neural networks, are quite often common. So that's an increasing area of interest for libraries. But to date, the majority of work that's been done in this sector is actually utilizing machine learning technologies. So I just got a little list here for those less familiar with what's going on in libraries, I'm sort of inspired by a couple of reports that are really key in the development of understanding what's going on. Ryan Cordell and... Um, Oh, I've forgotten his name, Cox. I'll, I'll try and look up his name. I always call him Simon Cox, and that's someone else, which is horrible of me. And um, so generally, we have a few things. So we've got things like... Um, annotation, looking at how we can annotate collections. Um, we've got things like clustering and classification, the use of machine learning technologies to identify connections between the collections. 
We've also got metadata recognition and extraction, tabular data extraction, and also an area of interest for practitioners and researchers alike is how we actually create machine actionable collections the, to meet this increasing demand from researchers um, for collections that, as Padilla said here, um, lend themselves to computational use. And there are all sorts of things that have to go into that. So my research now looks at responsible and explainable AI. So Shannon Valor's definition, which is from the Edinburgh Declaration on Responsible AI, refines that as responsible development and governance of AI and autonomous systems. So she ident the group who wrote this um, identified several characteristics of what it means to be responsible for AI. First is actually accepting responsibility rather than saying that it is society's responsibility or government's responsibility, that within the context we work in, it may actually be our responsibility. And then there's seeing responsibility as relational, understanding it's not just part of our work, but has relationships to broader societal, human, legal, and, and, and regulatory environments. Prioritizing responsibility as attending to vulnerability, and also focusing on the sustainability of responsible AI and autonomous systems. If anybody's interested in following up this in specifically in relation to libraries, I recommend Padelia's work on responsible operations, um, which kind of expands on this. So I just wanted to, to, to talk a little bit about my current research, these last few projects, and I've probably got maybe a minute or so for that. Um, so as I said, there was this progression from looking at information resources more generally, looking primarily at digitized collections and thinking about the impact on users. But ever since around sort of that 2017 to 19 period, when I was looking at collections and thinking, this is inescapable. We can't, we can't consider information resources anymore without considering artificial intelligence. That's really informed my research agenda. So 2020 was the kind of start of this, looking at this global digitized data set network. Um, this was a research network funded by AHRC networking scheme, working with Hutty Trust, the National Library of Scotland, National Library of Wales, and the British Library. Library. And we were looking at how you could normalize metadata across institutions to effectively create a single point of access for digitized texts. There were all sorts of questions there, but I think the most relevant one in relation to AI and in relation to where we've progressed to the final project I'll talk about is this question of what globalism versus localism means. What does it mean to be global? And the inverse of that, what does it mean for something to be local? And the second body of work here, and I've mentioned this because it's important important to know this was led by Joe Knuckles, who I'm PhD supervisor for, second supervisor. And Joe has been working and co-authored several papers with us over the last few years on the impact of handwritten text recognition. So that's a machine learning technology that extends the, the functionality of optical character recognition into manuscript and handwritten materials. So there's potentially real transformational transformational ability there, but we need to consider the human aspect. How does this disrupt or extend the human relationship to manuscript materials? How does it affect things like working practices? How does it affect something like archival multivocality multi that we're able to, to provide machine readable versions of different texts from different voices? And this brings me to the current project, just to wrap up, which is called iReal. And this is a braid scoping project that's currently ongoing we're looking at how we can center indigenous perspectives into the AI requirements elicitation process in libraries. And so we're kind of, I, I see this as a progression of the work I've done, this really important centering of the human perspective into AI, which I see as so important. And this, this arises from the sort of, you know, the, the need to consider what happens when we start to operationalize materials from, from specific communities. So in this case, looking at indigenous knowledges, the fact that there are collections around the world that have been extracted from indigenous communities that may be utilized or be the subject of artificial intelligence processes. And so we're sort of operationalizing two important things from the indigenous archives collection position statement on the right to reply, which are the right to reply, the right for the indigenous communities to actually reply to the use 
of their materials in artificial intelligence systems, but also the right to know, to get people together in a room through a series of workshops for both indigenous peoples and librarian practitioners and research technology professionals to better know and understand the perspectives that each of those communities has on the work being done. So it's very early days in that project, it's running through till October, but we're really focused on making sure that those human voices are brought into the center of that. So I'll wrap up there, I'll probably talk for like six or seven instead, so I apologize. Right, that's everything, thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. That's great. And although it's from a different perspective, it's a really useful one. Um, you will remember from Amy's video, she was talking about language and terminology as well. So I think it will be another interesting point for our discussions later. <laughs> our next um, speaker, Sarah Ames, the Digital Scholarship Librarian from the National Library of Scotland, wasn't able to come physically, but she sent and she very she worked really hard to record also her presentation. Um, so I'm going to, she's online though, and she will answer any questions and comments you might put in the chat as well. Uh, but we're going to play this from here. And if I share this with the sound, did I put the sound? I can't remember. Yeah. Shall I stop the sharing? This? Just be safe and share it again. Because I'm not sure I clicked that button. There, it was clicked. And if we maximize it, do you want to? Shall I make it first full? Hi, I'm, I'm going to about our work at the National Library of Scotland around digital research and AI. Um, we've been thinking a lot about AI recently and the implications of using AI with the collections for the library, for our services and our audiences. And I wanted to share some of this with you today. So as part of our initial thinking about an organisational approach to AI, in 2022, we conducted an environmental scan of the library's work relating to AI to staff attitudes towards it and next steps. Um, this process highlighted how AI had already become a part of some of the library's day-to-day -day workings, posing a number of questions about the relationship between AI and knowledge organisations, the opportunities and challenges that lie ahead, and how and if libraries can adopt AI in a coherent and a consistent way. The recommendations from this report are fed into our newly signed off AI statement for the library, um, which outlines our commitment as an organisation towards responsible adoption of AI. This will be published online in the coming weeks and it will guide our decision making around AI tools, communication and collecting. So some big questions for today and particularly for a five minute talk. What's the role of a national library in this AI revolution, as it's being called? How can libraries themselves make use of such technologies? And what are the challenges that we face as trusted stewards of information in a world where nothing is as it seems? Big questions, but ones that small experiments can start to chip away at. Um, since the launch of our open data platform, Data Foundry, back in 2019, and with the digitization of thousands of our map collections, we've been involved in a number of small projects involving the use of AI with the collections. And I wanted to give you just a quick tour of a few of these right now um, and what, talk about what we think it means for us and for our audiences. So our three areas of activity with AI have fallen into the following categories, um, enhancing access and research, creating efficiencies and social benefit and engagement. And there's a few examples just listed underneath there. And I was going to talk through a few of them in a bit more detail now. So around enhancing access and research, one of the main routes for our involvement with AI experiments is our annual digital scholarship fellowship. Our first fellow was Dr. Giles Bergel of Oxford, Oxford University, um, and he used, tool, um, he used tools that his team at Oxford are developing in image recognition to identify re, um, reuse of chapbook illustrations and to explore what this tells us about printing in the 18th and 19th centuries, um, potentially also enabling another route in for users to access and explore our chapbooks. Dr. Rosa Filguera from Edinburgh University, meanwhile, is creating an AI toolbox for use with our data sets. This sits on top of the data sets and it will enable all users, whether they can code or not, to explore the data set in depth and at scale, opening up new avenues um, of research and improving access to our data sets too. And Joe Knuckles, PhD student, um, is exploring how handwritten text recognition software is changing the library and archival landscape um, for computational access to handwritten collections. So all of these projects aren't without the issues of um, data quality and consistency, but they demonstrate how AI can be used to, um, to enable new research questions or problems and also enhance access to collections. 
And then maps. So what does a map look like as data and what can this mean for AI projects and how could it improve access to our collections? Amongst a number of projects overseen by our maps curator, Chris Fleet, including um, identifying symbols on maps and aspects of maps such as rail space. We've been involved in a series of projects recently to identify trees in the UK, as you can see here. Um, and how wooded areas have changed over time in this collaboration with Zulu Ecosystems. How could these projects help with research into environmental or historical changes? How could they provide new routes to discovery, for example? We're also interested in how cataloging efficiencies can be gained using AI. This example uses HTR to automate um, extraction of metadata from maps um, using transcribers to identify sheet titles of microfilmed OS maps and print codes from part of the paper map collections. And we've been involved in a number of other projects using computer vision to this end as well. And then around social benefit and engagement. Um, so we've been really lucky to work with artists and creative projects over the past few years. And these collaborations have really shown how cultural heritage has an important role to play in encouraging critical thinking about the role of AI and new technologies. Our first artist in residence, Martin Disley, used machine learning techniques and uh, with the collections, initially producing these eerie mangled metal bridges based on our Tay Bridge images. And then he moved on to using maps at scale, exploring the idea of the truth of the map alongside the truth or not of AI. These maps aren't real, so they're versions of a Scotland that never existed, complete with slightly wonky compasses pointing towards a, a false north. Martin's work leads us to question what is real about maps and highlights the problematic and political nature of cartography. We've also had the pleasure of working with Marion Carey, working with our broadsides data set to compare the construction of an archive to the construction of truth itself. Her three-part work explores issues around authenticity and fake news through the lens of AI. And here are some images of her exhibitions in Glasgow and Paris. Um, these artworks have been instrumental in showing how the intersection be between cultural heritage and AI can be really instructive and also really concerning. So after that quick tour, just to return to the start, what does all of this mean for a national library? Why are we doing this? What have we found out? Well, we found out that AI used with human oversight can support our mission to improve access to collections, to create efficiencies and can support new avenues of research. We found, as expected, that we have to beware of underlying biases in our data and in our collections, and we now need to work on how to communicate these. And we found that data quality and formats, as well as providing the scale of data needed for training models, are, really, uh, are a real challenge. We found that adopting AI in a coherent and a consistent way is a big challenge. So, so many of our systems already use AI. How do we keep track of this? How do we communicate it? How do we understand it and explain it? And how do we collect it too? And last, we found that the use of AI with library collections can and must encourage us and our audiences to engage in broader critical thinking about the relationship between cultural heritage, truth, authority, technology, and the world around us. So I'll leave things there. Um, thanks very much for listening. And I'm really looking forward to hearing the other talks too. Thanks so much, Sarah. This was really great. I'm just the recording. Um, I don't know, some people, we said to the people in the chat to leave the questions for afterwards. So we'll leave questions for Sarah together with the other speakers. Our next speaker, Cassie Kiss, that used to be at Information Studies, but now Strathclyde stole it, stole her from us, <laughs> uh, is going to very nicely complement what we've been saying, kind of going back to the visitor engagement questions that uh, Marion started posing um, in her talk. She's going to talk at, about chatbots and how you communicate with different people. So although it's going to be focused more on museums, um, she, there's things there, I think, about engagement across all the cultural heritage institutions that are very relevant. And while Cassie is familiarizing herself with the microphone, I'm going to open her presentation and put it there. Well, I definitely also feel like a superstar with this. <laughs> I actually don't really like it. It reminds me a bit of karaoke and I am tragically terrible at karaoke. So it's bringing up a bit of, a bit of trauma. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to talk to you very briefly today about connecting with heritage through an inhuman touch. 
So for those who don't know me, my name is Cassandra Kiss. I'm a Chancellor's Fellow at the University of Strathclyde, and my research is really interested in how um, digital platforms for engaging socially and dialogically with heritage and others impact processes of social inclusion and exclusion. And I'm currently just starting to embark on a project looking at how chatbots can be designed for meaningful engagement with heritage in museums. So I'm going to talk today about the first step of that project, which is a literature review, and some of the observations I've made, I've made regarding three designs across trends of chatbots implemented in museums, and how these are framed in the literature to use this as a jumping off point for thinking about alternative designs. So from this literature review, I've so far identified 75 conversational agents implemented in museums from 1996 to 2023. And there's three main um, trends and designs related to humanizing conversational agents in this literature. And the way they are framed in the literature, I think reflect and are entangled with common ideals associated with visitor learning in the sector. So the first trend is this kind of, oh, is it showing? Oh yes, the other screen isn't showing, sorry. <laughs> Um, the first trend is to um, kind of have these conversational agents embody a physical or visual humanistic appearance through, for example, facial expressions, emotions, or personality their personalities. So since almost 1997s, museums have tried to implement conversational agents that embody these humanistic appearances. And the way they are framed in the literature is about kind of idealizing these appearances for how they enable their approachability for visitors and their willingness to engage, um, reflecting an ideal of visitor engagement and meaning making as being a social process. So the second trend is this um, kind of pursuit of sociality, but specifically through natural humanistic conversations. And it's this humanistic and natural communication that is seen to enable visitor meaning making. Conversely, when the agent is unable to um, interact in humanistic ways, this is viewed very negatively and as hindering that meaning making process. And finally, the last trend across these conversational agents is their ability to personalize interactions. And this is idealized for the way that they can enable visitors to pursue their own interests and privilege their own agency in the meaning making process. And this also overlaps in the literature with making conversational agents personable. So they're seen as cultivating this kind of connection between visitors and the museum institution, for instance, as a direct relationship with the institution or as developing and maintaining relationships with visitors. So to sum up, the literature highlights a trend of humanizing these technologies in three different ways. The first is through the visual and physical manifestation of these agents as human-like, its ability to hold conversations, but specifically in very naturalistic ways. And finally, to personalize visitor interactions and experiences. And these are framed in a way that reflect and embody museums' ideals associated with learning in which meaning is constructed by the learner. It's a personal, social, and emotional experience. So I'd like to use this as a basis for thinking about alternative designs. So I'd like to ask instead, what if we focus less on the human embodiment and mimicking human-like appearances or interaction? And what would that have, um, what value would that have for visitor experiences? So for instance, what if we tried to value a conversational agent's clunkiness, their ingrained failures, mistakes, and their more artificial nature? So this, of course, exposing the kind of technological nature of conversational agents can evoke a distance between visitors and heritage and content. Um, and I think this could have value for three different ways. The first is cultivating feelings of safety for visitors. So there's some indication in previous research that visitors to, for instance, a gallery setting prefer chatbots over interacting with a human docent. And this might be because they feel more comfortable or safe and maybe exposing that technological nature might enhance those feelings of safety. The second is by supporting empathy and empathetic feelings of visitors. So often in cultural heritage settings, we want to enable empathetic experiences of visitors. And this often requires a bit of a distance between visitors and heritage content. Um, and one way to cultivate this distance is potentially through technolo technology and technological interfaces. 
And finally, the last point is maybe by enabling less distractions and more attention on heritage. So if we only focus on one form of human embodiment, for example, audio only interactions, this might enable more attention on collections and less on the digital interface. So those are just my thoughts so far. And if you would like to check out the list of conversational agents that I've been using and looking at, you can find them at the QR code. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Cassie. It's a lot of interesting things about the human embodiment there. So we have last but definitely not least, because um, William Kilbride for the Digital Preservation Coalition. And we talked uh, a lot about the creation validation of these things, but also there's a lot of interesting issues, some of which Sarah raised as well about their curation. There's also about the digital preservation. So... I will give me one minute, Will, to... Yeah, I'm happy to share my slides, actually. I'll, a few... Uh, uh, it's easier if I run them from here. Okay, no problem. Then I'll stop this. And on to you. Am I still sharing? Oh, I'll stop the share. There we go. There we go. Excuse me, just one moment. I said that would be easier. I'm not sure it is. Here we go. Here we go. Of the hybrid. Yeah. Got too many things open on my desktop. That's always the problem. Okay, that's it now. You can control it, so it's probably better if you do it. Hold on a moment. Yeah, you can see it's fine. So mute mine and on to you. Oh, sorry, one moment, one moment. I need to stop that. I've just got my notes are on the wrong page now. Right, that's better. Sorry, everyone. I'm going to be replaced with artificial intelligence myself. Right, let's try that again. Okay, you got that now? You got the right screen up? It's my slide, holding slide? You can see you fine. Perfect. Okay. So listen, Maria, uh, listen, Lynn, everyone, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm sorry I can't be with you today. Just too many other things on. I really wish I could join the conversation. I've been making so many notes uh, as we've been, as I've been listening in. So thank you uh, very much. I want to give you four themes uh, in artificial intelligence from the perspective of digital preservation. And uh, that's hence the joke, AI forever. So let me put everyone on the same page as it seems normal. What I'm going to be talking about is digital preservation, and I'm going to be talking about digital preservation from the perspective, obviously, uh, of artificial intelligence. So we're going to be looking at the process, the activities necessary to ensure continued access to artificial intelligence for as long as necessary, uh, beyond the limits of the, the usual failures of media, obs media obsolescence, technical uh, obsolescence, or organisational change. Now, it seems to me, thinking around very broadly, the digital preservation challenge as it approaches uh, artificial intelligence, there are really four uh, themes here. And I want to present those four themes as they exist in practice uh, and then make a call for a bit of a research uh, agenda. So it seems to me there are four ways in which uh, artificial intelligence and digital preservation uh, match. And they're not all equal, and they're not all uh, equally well developed. Certainly, if you look at practical applications of artificial intelligence within the digital preservation community, you're going to find, and you can identify, a reasonable number of artificial intelligence tools which are deployed to help preservation uh, purposes. And you've heard some of these already uh, today. Joe Knuckles, uh, Knuckles' work on uh, handwriting, uh, for example, but also a uh, really celebrated case study now of uh, the work that Google did with the White House Historical Association, looking at uh, image and uh, facial recognition in particular to do an enormous back cataloging uh, job. Uh, the work that, for example, a very straightforward piece of work that the World Bank has done in relation to the filing and the appraisal uh, of video, uh, especially video conferences, uh, which has allowed them to make sense of very massive uh, data sets. Uh, also, uh, how sound, how oral history uh, transcription emerges uh, as a theme, even some very old 
uh, recordings. I'm thinking about uh, some of the work uh, in uh, uh, in Italy by uh, Filippo Mengoni, where you look at oral history collections and you generate the text uh, out of there. And why have I picked those four examples? Because there's many, many more. The, what they point to is artificial intelligence really approaching digital objects as as platform. Okay, so it can cope with all of these different uh, media types and approach them all in a more or less uh, systematic fashion. So AI tools that will help with digital preservation beginning to emerge, especially for the purposes of appraisal uh, and classification and selection uh, of materials. There's less evidence, but it should we should pause for a moment and consider where DP tools are also helpful to artificial uh, intelligence. I suppose the most obvious example of this is in access to data. Uh, remember that a lot of the systems we're looking at assume very large, extremely large language models and digital preservation typically sits on top of very large amounts uh, of data. And so uh, there should be, in theory, a sort of hope, maybe a naive one, that digital preservation and all those digital collections are to some extent supporting uh, and to some extent, therefore, also the ethics of the collecting of those materials should influence the ethics of the outcomes of the uh, large language models and their implementations as tools. I think that's a perhaps a naive uh, hope. There is, however, uh, because access to born digital uh, archives, access to born digital preserved digital collections is relatively poor. Uh, in the context of digital preservation, everyone's focus is on ingest and there's relatively less effective work to my mind around access. Even so, computational access guides do exist, and I'm reminded of Leontine Talbum's work when she worked at the National Archives and uh, Q, uh, which is published as a, a guide for computational access. And that sort of guide allows for that sort of machine learning, which we've heard quite a lot of uh, already. It seems to me that digital preservation has a task to preserve the outputs of artificial uh, intelligence and perhaps using tools to detect and to authenticate the outputs of artificial intelligence. I mean, it's an election year. It's never not an election year uh, somewhere, but it puts you in mind of the need for the identification of, of deep fakes, you know, and how are we going to do that? Well, insofar as a lot of those documents, a lot of those materials are themselves the product of artificial intelligence, it seems to me a wide open goal for us to set a thief to catch a thief, that we should be using artificial intelligence tools to do that detection for us. The last theme I want to turn to, and I'm going to pause for a bit on this, is to think about preservation of artificial intelligence at a systemic level. How do we ensure uh, reproducibility? Well, let me take you back to March 2023 when ChatGPT or GPT-4 was released uh, on uh, the unsuspecting world, somewhat delayed but with sufficient capability to justify the astonished uh, headlines. What was also amazing to me were the terms under which uh, GPT-4 was released. The OpenAI technical paper, which came along with the release, was surprisingly opaque about how the tools work uh, and how they were trained. The supporting report contained no or few details about the architecture, about the model size, the hardware, the training compute, the data con set construction, the training methods used, and so on. That seemed to me to be a bigger story uh, than the extraordinary results which it was able to produce. It's reminiscent of Amazon's Mechanical Turk, uh, which gave the impression of artificial omniscience, but had the hard labour subsequently described as photonation. Now, GPT-4 is a chatbot. It's a language simulator. It's not the only or even the most important form of artificial intelligence. But I am not seeing a lot of transparency from other providers either. As a general rule, as Sarah has indicated too, as a general rule, artificial intelligence has emerged from military and surveillance computing. And you can expect opaqueness and avoidance of regulation not to be a bug, but to be a feature. Now, it's for others to point out the ethical, legal or environmental concerns that arise. But for the record, I don't think we're going to have much luck asking the inner workings, asking about the inner workings of systems in order that we can better preserve them. Either way, there's a big conversation to be had about what kinds of reproducibility uh, we want. And it's entirely possible that we're asking the wrong kinds of questions. That's partly because established models and preservation offer approaches which work for documents and for data which serve well 
a computing paradigm of the last century uh, and will continue to be useful in contexts where documents and data are self-contained, but which offer little to meet the emerging challenges of reproducible AI. So to conclude, uh, it's report card season, ladies and gentlemen. Some of you will have your kids coming back from school clutching their report cards, and I want to give you just a very brief report card on the preservation of artificial intelligence. And I think this is one of those areas where we could do better, and I think this is an area where these sorts of conversations will produce the research agenda, which I think we all very badly need. That was all I wanted to offer you today, uh, and I'm very happy to be here and very happy to join in the conversations uh, earlier. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Will. That's great. We are predictably running a bit late <laughs> because what we wanted, and also you've been very patient, um, but I think it's useful to have some at least quick Q&A, especially from the people online, because we will soon say goodbye to them and you'll have much more chance to kind of have more focused discussions within your table. Uh, so Lynn is going to keep an eye. She's running out of juice on her machine, so she's not hiding. She's just staying there near near the power. She's going. So people on the online, please do put things in the chat. And Weiwei, can you make again the way I've been Butching, like make all the faces <laughs> appear from the other mode. Um, but we can have from the room um, any quick comments or, com or questions uh, while we're getting organized with the online people. Is there anyone? Tim? Uh, sorry, and I will I will switch to the other one and have this as a roving mix. Of, oh, sorry, so sorry. So people can hear. Thanks. So, yeah, thanks, Maria, for organizing this. I mean, I thought there's talks were incredibly rich um this is something i thought about while i was listening to sarah and paul speaking but uh, william it also came up in william's um paper at the end it's something about kind of rationality or reason right so if we kind of accept that these kind of terms is not like a universal reason that we all you know the kind of rationality that's introduced by ai systems and thinking about that in terms of the, the content the, the things they tell us which we attribute to being errors like the um exhibitions that didn't happen or the idea of kind of universalizing knowledge and kind of obscuring the local local knowledge if we stop looking at those as errors but start looking at those as actually like that's like a goal right that's like the rationality of ai is to just be really confident about the knowledge it's producing that, it, that is wrong, what happens then, right? You know, so, and how do we kind of protect against that? Because Sarah, that you, you can tell that scenario because you're a curator, you know these things didn't take place. But if you're a 15 year old high school student doing a project, you that's what it's telling you, you know? And is that something about the rationality of this system that introduces, it's better to be persuasive and be correct, or it's better to be global and to be local. It's, I think, came through. Yeah, anyway, that's, that's just an That's option. a very big question. Does anybody want to try and answer it? Sarah, you would try and go. There's Paul over there and, and Sarah here. Yeah, I, I guess I'm thinking about discernment. And uh, I was having a conversation with a student this morning about uh, museum collections and a late 19th century desire to complete a collection. And uh, AI functions on statistics, right? So it wants as much data as possible to make the best estimated guess of what the next thing in the in the list is. And that is a mentality that is colonial, that involves extraction, and that involves completing the set. Um, and so that's why we should be wary of that rationality, because right? it's something we've tried to avoid in museums not lately. Sorry, it's a peripatetic. We only have one mic. That's all right. I'll, I'll kind of, I won't stand in the middle because it feels really weird. Um, yeah, Tim, I, it, it comes back. I was, I was alluding in my talk as well to the, the human versus non-human axis. And obviously now we're to the point where, where artificial intelligence is clearly a non-human actor in these relationships we're talking about. So I think there's, there's, there's a productive route forward. In, and it's a really difficult one in trying to work out the difference between 
what is embodied in AI that is already situated in humans and what the non-human actor is bringing to the table in this scenario you present, which is actually different and arises from the artificial intelligence. So something like globalization is the perfect example. That's the product of half a century or more of Western thinking around capitalism and globalization. The fact that AI is embodying that not a surprise given what we're we're basing the data sets on. So so that for me there's that interesting question of of exploring where where those human biases are already embodied in AI and where AI is actually producing new or different takes on a topic which could potentially help us to understand what those non-human actors are bringing to the table. That's really interesting. Before I pass on to you, and I forgot to say, if you can identify yourself, if you haven't already introduced as a speaker, that will be useful for everybody. And we have one question online, then we pass on here for Marion. I don't know if you've seen it, Marion. It's about the yeah. museum. I really just made the letters are a bit small for some people, like me, without my glasses. For museums, the paintings and other artworks can be said to have the creator's vision or their political stance embedded in it. How do you ensure that these messages come across in the AI tools which interact with the users? What about the various interpretations of those messages? Um, yeah, so I'm going to give an answer that um, also jump on what just has been said. Um, I think it's interesting to think about uh, AI as um, a mirror of uh, ourselves and uh, society um, considering the data they are using um, and but also what AI from my point of view brings to the table is another way to manipulate and to learn and to extrapolate from this data with some manipulation that we as humans can't do even if there is like plenty of things we do and that AI don't do and so I think like the comparison with the uh, humans and the to think that AI is going to, to replace human is, is sometimes wrong. And now to be more specific and uh, answer to the, to the specific question that I've been asked, I would say that um, actually it's everything depends on the data uh, that has been created by the museum team. So if they create data about those like various aspects of the artwork or like the political, political stance, then um, the tool is going to answer about it. Uh, if they didn't, it's not. And I think this kind of tool and it's the kind of um, a project we are talking about with various cultural organizations is, is also a good way to make various voices, um, to highlight various voices and point of view about artworks and to work with communities to create knowledge about a specific piece or a specific artwork. And I think this kind of curation that is needed for what we are doing, which means that to have artificial intelligence using curated knowledge base um, is also an opportunity to uh, engage uh, communities. Um, and so, of course, it's something that needs the knowledge of creators to like identify the right data and put it into the AI, but it's also a good way, I think, to engage communities to uh, create knowledge about uh, pieces and artwork and, and archives. Thank you so much. That's a lot of questions about the role and redefinition of the curator, the creator, the visitor, and kind of being brought like all closer together. Thanks a lot, Marion. We'll take one question from the room and what I'll, we'll do afterwards, because I'm conscious, I promise we'll have a lot of time to interact. We will close our mix and the online people, you're welcome to leave or interact with each other online. We won't be curating that chat and we will move to, we'll say goodbye to you with a lot of thanks to our speakers and all the participants who joined. And then we'll uh, kind of move our discussions face to face in the room. Um, I'll take that question and explain afterwards also about PowerPoints and what we're doing with sharing resources uh, before we say goodbye to you. So on to you, thanks for the patience. Hi, uh, first year PhD uh, candidate. Uh, my research looks at post-conflict reconstruction of cultural heritage. And I came across this case of uh, the 3D construction of the replica of the Triumphal Arch in Syria. And it was done by the Institute for Digital Archaeology UK. My question is how 
ethical such form of reconstruction can be also like in the time of AI? And then who owns such form of reconstruction? Do local communities own such form of reconstructed or digitally, uh, you know, sort of digitally curated cultural heritage? Or does the ownership lie within the institute? Also, because Triumphal Arch is a World Heritage Site, like, is it owned by everyone? And is it the right time that um, cultural heritage practitioners should also like start thinking around ethics of using AI and other digital technologies to sort of reconstruct cultural heritage sites, especially the sites in the global south, because a lot of these technologies are owned by Western institutes. So like, yeah, if anyone could answer that. Thank you. I think the question already raised the issues and it's great that you have a PhD looking into it. I can say as somebody who started life as an archaeologist, the minute you talk about reconstruction in any form, ethics should go together with it. But you raised some really interesting questions. I think Paul and his team, there's also other colleagues working with decolonizing heritage more broadly, not just through AI. I don't know if you want to briefly, if somebody wanted to address this, but I think it's, an, to be honest, I think it's a question for us to all think about. Just push. The aspect's really important. Um, there's there's the legal answer and the ethical answer, isn't there? Which is probably something that you'll be wrestling with in your own research. If the legal answer is probably the Western institutions own them. There's the, the, the complicating factors without getting too much into it about you know copyright and if you can apply copy you know, digitized images. I think the UK government position is you can only own copyright of out of copyright images as a digitizing organization if you've actually done something transformative which I suspect people would be arguing that creating a 3D reconstruction is transformative. But then it comes to the ethical questions of back to the, you know, the, that that localism question of if you have a legal perspective on what, what that is, how how do you how do you take that localized perspective of if not taking ownership as a community of something, owning ownership of the narratives around that, taking ownership of the stories that are being told, taking ownership of something that's become fixed in an archive, but making it a living part of that stakeholder community's life and history. Uh, so I don't have good answers to that, but that's perhaps some of the, some of my initial thoughts. My quote, so the last answer I was going to give is on the ethics. When we should, when is now the right moment for us to be thinking about this? No, because it should have been five years ago, is my answer to that. It's good that we are now thinking about it, but we, as as you know, as a cultural heritage sector in general, the moment that these technologies came along, we should have been thinking of them. And people were, so I don't want to dismiss the good work that's been done, should have been thinking about them there and then. And as new issues arise, we should be thinking about them as well. So in a sense, no, but only because we should have done it sooner. Yeah. <laughs> Great. I'm going to stop there. Not completely, but thank you so much, everyone. Thank you to all our online participants and speakers again. I We haven't said so far, but we're, I'm going to try, and I'm sure because most people consented already, we're going to check on a few where we have artist images and things like that. But we're going to try to share with everybody that registered through Eventbrite, both online and on site, the slides from all the talks. Thank you for all the thank yous we're seeing in the participant in the chat there. I'm sorry to the online people, we cannot offer you drinks and cakes, uh, but hopefully we'll have the chance to interact soon. It wasn't intentional on my side that so many uh, speakers cross-referenced each other. I think it's just a sign they're the best in the world beyond Scotland working on this. But that's my take on this. Thank you so much. I will leave it on. So if you, some of you want to talk to among yourselves, you're welcome to, but we'll just um, pause from here.